When we're young, our parents tell us to be afraid of the monster that's hiding under our beds or lurking in our closets. They teach us that this object or mythical creature only comes out at night when we're sleeping. So naturally, as children, we're afraid of the dark, but we keep our eyes locked on this closet. If this sounds familiar, raise your hands. Okay, so most of us have been taught to fear this creature, and so we do. Sometimes we even carry this fear with us as we age, up until the moment we turn on the lights, walk to the door, and open it to realize that there's nothing there. There is no object, there is no mythical creature, no threat exists in our room. So in essence, we've been taught to fear something that doesn't exist, but it took for us to walk to that door and to open it to realize that and to rid ourselves of that fear. Now, I want you to think about the first time you did that, the courage it took to walk to that door and to open it. Today, I hope to reawaken this courage within you as we discuss new, more complex fears that may have replaced that trivial one. Today, our world is not completely conservative and not completely liberal, as we well know. Our world is a cosmopolitan one in almost every sense of the word, politics, religion, personal, and societal beliefs. This diverse world has been amplified by the information age that we've entered into and will most likely stay in for quite some time. Scientists claim that the human brain receives 35 gigabytes of information every day. Eric Schmidt, Google's CEO, made a memorable statement in the Technomy conference when, in 2010, he claimed, and I quote, Every two days now, we create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization, end quote. However, you would think that with more information, our world would suddenly become so much more connected, therefore so much more understanding, and therefore so much more peaceful. However, easy access to big data creates what the Aga Khan refers to as empathy gaps. In his Ogden lecture, he claimed, and I quote, Information travels more quickly and in greater quantities these days, but the incalculable multiplication of information can also mean more error, more exaggeration, more misinformation, more disinformation, and more propaganda. More information at our fingertips can mean more knowledge and more understanding, but it can also mean more fleeting attention spans, more impulsive judgments, and more dependence on superficial snapshots of events. Communication more often and more easily can bring people closer together, but it can also tempt us to live more and more of our lives in smaller and smaller information bubbles, in more intense, yet often more isolated groupings, end quote. Within these bubbles and within these groupings, we create labels for people, ideas, and environments that we don't have the time to fully digest or research. As we get older and receive more information, we solidify these labels, even if we receive contradictory information. Once a label has been created, it takes large amounts of energy to reverse the stereotype equations that we've already made. An interesting study took place at USC, where neuroscientists wanted to discover the part of the brain that was involved in disagreements. So what they decided to do was place 40 participants through an MRI, which showed a series of controversial statements, such as, laws restricting gun ownership should be made more restrictive, or gay marriage should not be legalized. These participants were shown these statements, and the neuroscientists were fascinated because the same part of the brain that is triggered in a physical threat was triggered in this case if the participants did not agree with the statement. The amygdala, or the emotional center of the brain, is triggered when we are perhaps being attacked by a predator. In essence, the home of the fight or flight response. However, the simple fact that we feel threatened in a disagreement made me question why this happens. Why do we create defense mechanisms when we don't agree with other people in order to protect our strongly held beliefs and opinions? I was reading a comic the other day that was inspired by the You Are Not So Smart podcast, and it spoke about this very issue. Essentially, our brain creates a house of our worldviews that is based on our childhood, our adulthood, our various experiences, the people we grew up with, and the family we surrounded ourselves with. When a new piece of information is introduced, our brain creates obstacles for that new idea 
or perspective in order to preserve the thoughts and stereotypes that we've been developing and perfecting for years. Although I understood the fact that we try to solidify our beliefs more and more every day, why did we fear the fact that perhaps we were wrong? Why are we neurologically triggered when somebody else's opinions don't align with our own? In his podcast, You're Not So Smart, by David Rainey, a psychology writer, photographer, and television host, he claimed, and I quote, if you were to learn that the Great Wall of China isn't the only man-made object visible from space, you update your model of reality without much fuss. Some misconceptions we give up readily, replacing them with better information when alerted to our ignorance. For other constructs, though, your most cherished beliefs about things like politics, vaccines, and climate change, instead of changing your mind in the face of challenging evidence or compelling counterarguments, you resist. Most people rebound and not only reassert their original beliefs at their original strength, but go beyond that and dig in their heels, deepening their resolve." End quote. This is known as the backfire effect. As explained by Sarah Gimbel, one of the USC neuroscientists involved in the research, she claimed, and I quote, the response that we see in the brain is very similar to, say, what would happen if you were walking in a forest and came across a bear. Your mind would have this automatic fight or flight response and your body prepares to protect itself, end quote. In essence, the judgment that we make about a person, idea, or environment transforms into a belief. Now, don't get me wrong. Judgment is a necessity of life. Judgment protects us and our bodies generally from our surroundings. However, one downfall of judgment is that it protects our minds very, very, very strongly. When a new piece of information is introduced, judgment seems to lock down a fence around it that basically says, do not disturb. So here's the question that still bothered me. Why do we create defense mechanisms when we don't agree with other people? Putting together this information, I realized that the answer was actually so simple. We are afraid of not knowing something or to find out that suddenly we've just been proven wrong. The concept of fear is quite interesting because it's more complex than what we would believe. Neurologically, fear is a hardwired part of our brains. Scientists have studied the various networks that link the limbic system to the prefrontal cortex that are associated with fear. However, you would think that these networks are electrically or chemically stimulated when we perhaps open the door to our surprise birthday party or when we stomp on the car brakes when we see a car backing up in front of us. However, these networks are also triggered when we have taught somebody to be afraid of somebody else. Fear is instinctive, but it can also be taught and it can be learned. But let's consider the other side as well. Fear has protected us from day one. In an uncomfortable situation, fear tells us to leave or run away. However, one downfall of fear is that sometimes our brains will create a state of conditioned fear in which our minds will come up with every possible scenario in which we may have to wake up our fight or flight response. However, while you and I both might fear a needle at the doctor's office, when did we learn to fear a certain type of person because of the color of their skin or their race or their gender or their sexual orientation or their class or their culture or their heritage? When did we begin to place certain stereotypes on people when we were afraid that they weren't like us? Fear amplifies fear. It's a cyclical pattern that we can't get out of unless we individually choose to do so. Think about it. If I told you to fear Muslims through the media over and over and over and over again, at the end of the day, I've implanted a certain fear of a certain group within you that you'll remember for quite some time. The worst part about the fear of uncertainty and doubt is the fact that we do it in our discussions with others. When we come across somebody we don't agree with, we feel threatened because at that moment we think, what if I'm wrong? Maybe that person wasn't who you thought she was. Or maybe that other candidate actually had some really good points. Or maybe that environment that you've heard so many negative things about actually has some beauty to it that you never considered. Judgment of an environment can often lead to the judgment of its people as well. Last summer, I attended a camp called Global Encounters. Global Encounters is an international program for Ismaili Muslim youth focused on service, leadership development, and global citizenship. During my trip, my group and I traveled from Karachi to Islamabad and concluded our trips in the northern areas, specifically Hunza and Gilgit. 
cultural preservation, natural beauty, advanced medical technology. Are these the words that come into your mind when you think of a country like Pakistan? Before leaving for Pakistan in the summer of 2017, I was entangled with an innate fear of visiting my mom's home country. Never having visited before, my family members quite often exaggerated the need for me to stay hyper-cautious of my surroundings and never to be seen or left alone. However, little did I know that I would have an experience that would transform my perspective on women in third world countries. During one of the cultural exposure site visits in Gilgit, my group and I were divided into various activities that were prominent in the northern regions, including wood carving, cooking, and embroidery. During our time in Karachi, however, we noticed that a wide variety of the shops and businesses we explored were predominantly run by men. However, in Gilgit, we met two women who began to tell us that while their husbands were often working in the deeper ends of the village to provide for their families, sometimes the money that they would bring home wouldn't be sufficient to even feed one child. Due to this, teams of women gathered together to apply for loans and build businesses from the skills that they did have. Whether that be sewing, cooking, or wood carving, suddenly groups of Muslim women became entrepreneurs, feeding their families on their own. So why don't we ever talk about stories like this? This form of women empowerment is a side to Pakistan I never would have seen had I not visited the country. So here's the question that still remained. Can we actually overcome the fears that we do have? Another question also remained. How do we combat this human need for judgment? In a world where so much information is consistently and constantly being produced, quickly judging and labeling gives us the ability to process information, however inaccurately, for convenience. So, the answer to our issues? Let's first catch the moment between stimulus and response. We as humans fear and reject that which we don't understand. So when we don't want to say, I don't know, we create films in our minds where the only actors involved are misconceptions that others may have given you. So, here's my challenge to you today. If you don't know the entirety of a person's story in your math class or at your job, or you don't know the entirety of an environment, don't create stories that you can't afford. We as humans fear the unknown, which is why we fear the words, I don't know. But those are the very words that can stimulate us, motivate us, and inspire us to know and to find out eventually. Socrates used to say, I know only one thing, and that is that I know nothing. We as humans fear the unknown, which is why we chase it. Do the same with people, ideas, beliefs, politics, religions, and environments, etc. Danger? Danger is real. But fear? Fear is a choice. Fear is a choice that I have and a choice that you have and a choice that we are completely in control of. You are in control of your judgment when you recognize that maybe you don't know everything, but maybe that's okay. As the West Wing show reminds us, complexity isn't a vice. We're smart enough to put the pieces together, so let's not be afraid to go get the pieces ourselves. If somebody has taught you that the monster actually does exist, it is up to you to open those closet doors and find out what's actually there. Thank you.